Hey everyone, welcome to the Tom's Hardware Podcast for August 3rd, 2021. As always, I'm Tom's Hardware Editor-in-Chief, Abram Felch, joined by Raspberry Pi expert Ash Puckett. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry, Ash Hill. I will, uh, and uh, Les, and Associate Editor Les Pounder. And our special guest this week is Ryder Damon, who has joined us before and does some writing for us. And uh, he's going to talk about his amazing porch pirate uh, detection and prevention system based on Raspberry Pi. So uh, if you, too, have had people stealing things off of your porch, uh, you can you can find new and exciting ways to to stop them. So um, anyway. How's how's everybody's week been going so far? Good. I'll say busy. I'll say busy. Yes, busy. Uh, <laughs> I've been uh, 3D printing busy uh, for uh, a lot lately, ever since we got this 3D printer, uh, which is something that we talked about in the show last week. My son just wants me to keep print 3D printing things all the time. It's like... Oh, yeah. uh, it's like, and you know, because it takes so long to 3D print something, it's like, uh, who are those, uh, those, what was that movie where they said always be closing? It's like always be printing, right? Mm -hmm. Always printing because it takes so long, you might as well uh, start it, start it going. So anyway, um, lots of exciting things to talk about with Raspberry Pi. So um, this week, we saw in the last week we saw Ryder. You put up an amazing uh, system which stops porch pirates. Can you tell everyone how that works? Sure. Um, so maybe a couple months ago, it was back in April, I think it was. Uh, I had a package stolen from my porch, and it's never happened to me before. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to live in an area where it's not really prevalent, but it happened, and I kind of got to thinking, I wonder if there's a way I can use like. Uh, a bit of code to prevent this kind of thing from happening. And it just kind of spiraled out of control from there. So um, what the system is, is I've trained um, an image classifier, a TensorFlow light model on whether or not there is or is not a package at my door. And uh, what that does is it allows me to detect, first of all, if someone has dropped off a package. And second of all, if that package is now missing from the frame unexpectedly. So if it's been stolen or not. Uh, and that's all done with a, a Raspberry Pi, um, a horn from a truck, uh, a sprinkler and a sprinkler controller, uh, a siren, a rotating beacon light, and um, and some other things here and there. So it's, uh, it's a system to try and stop people from stealing a package uh, and maybe get them to drop it as they run away. <laughs> uh -huh. So first of all, how does this, how do you exclude it from doing that when you pick the package up or when somebody else, another delivery person comes and drops a second package? Sure. So uh, the system has some flaws that everyone in my YouTube comments have been pointing out. Uh, but uh, if I want to take the package away, I need to, so it's all powered by uh, a camera. I have a wise cam because uh, it's an easy camera to use to, to connect with with the Raspberry Pi. So I have a wise cam that's kind of facing towards my door. And uh, if it notices the package is gone, the alarm goes off. However, if it sees uh, my face or a face of anyone I put in the known faces folder, um, and it recognizes that person, it will disarm the system for about 30 seconds. So within those 30 seconds, I can take the package and the alarm will not go off. If a delivery person is coming and adds a second package, now there are two packages uh, and the system will recognize that there is still a package, but it's a binary state. Either there is or is not a package. Unfortunately, I never trained it to, to count. So if there are two packages on my porch, well, you can steal one of them. So everyone in your neighborhood, we hope you're, we hope your neighbors aren't watching, because they now <laughs> know if they see two packages, they can get away with with stealing one. <laughs> yeah, without setting the system off. Yeah, a hundred percent. So now it 
but it's smart enough to know that that delivery person isn't stealing something as long as they don't remove the package. Yes, and as long as they don't obstruct the frame as well. The angle of the camera makes it difficult to obstruct the frame. You'd have to stand in a, a weird place, like in front of the door. Uh, but that could easily, if you're doing this yourself, that could easily be solved by like adding a second camera or a different placement of the camera. So now what happens if it detects somebody stealing a package? So if it detects someone stealing a package, uh, I added like a bit of a debounce function. So it needs to be sure that the package is in fact stolen because the model isn't always accurate. So I think maybe after about 10 frames of it confirming that the package hasn't been stolen, which uh, is about half a second, uh, it will then activate a series of relay channels. I have them all in threads so they can go on and off at different points. But uh, one is an air solenoid that's connected to uh, a truck horn. So there's a very loud, very loud truck horn blast. Uh, there's a siren and a rotating beacon that go off at the same time. So it's a lot of noise. Uh, and then it also turns on a sprinkler controller on the side of my house, which then has a sprinkler that's aimed at kind of the walkway away from it. So the sprinkler goes off and it sprays you. Uh, and then I had another idea. Um, uh, a couple friends of mine were suggesting you should use glitter, you should use glitter. And I figured if I was going to use glitter, it's pretty much always going to be in my lawn from that point on, so I didn't want to. Uh, so I used um, some flour, uh, and I built like a really simple venturi, and I have flour kind of shoot out of it, and it's all powered by compressed air, uh, because I was a little afraid that flour is, it, it is a little flammable, and I was a little afraid. <laughs> I'd be barbecuing my friends and my neighbors, and I didn't want to do that. Yes. Well, if they were really your friends, they wouldn't steal your package. True. Um, so that's, so what did your neighbors say? What did your neighbors say when you tested it? Did you get any complaints about the noise? <laughs> no, uh, some of them are actually in the video as testing it. So uh, like I said, there's not really a lot of the, the, the one theft that I've had is like the only time I've ever had a package taken in my life. So there's no way I could possibly wait around and film enough people who are actually stealing packages. Right. Yeah, you got to test it. Yeah. So I basically I just called everyone that I knew, neighbors included, and said hi. Like at any time, whenever you're ready, just come by. I've left a package on the porch. Please come by and try and steal it. <laughs> um, so some of my neighbors were were used to it. Uh, I definitely got a few stares from people walking past with all the commotion that it was making when I was testing it. But uh, yeah. People seem to enjoy it. Oh, well, that's great. I mean, everybody, I think everybody is frustrated by the the package theory that, that goes on. So this is a, this is a very interesting, very interesting solution. And, and one that like, I think a lot of people would, would want, right? I mean, don't, let's hope Amazon doesn't read it because they'll probably build it into, build it into the ring next version of ring, right? Um, <laughs> well, I think a couple cameras already have package detection as well. I'm not sure that they have alarms that go off if one is stolen, but I, I'm pretty sure a couple of them do notify you if you have a package. I think I think you should. So, is this still running? Uh, no, no. I have I only have one Raspberry Pi four with like eight gigs of RAM, and all my projects these days are pretty computationally expensive. So. I move that pie from thing to thing, and it's already on to the next oh. thing. Oh, so how are you <laughs> going to protect your packages? I guess. Uh, well, for the most part, I, I'm usually home a lot, so <laughs> I just and my dog, she likes to bark. So, um, yeah, I'm, I may bring the system back up, but it's really it's really not that big of a problem that I needed. I just I just I had the I had it happen to me, and I said this is a great excuse to build something way overpowered and unnecessary so so how long does it uh did it take you to program uh, uh to program not that long um the hard part was getting enough training data to actually train the model uh so instead of doing all the training from scratch i used a tool called uh, google cloud auto ml uh, and you just drag in your photos and it will create a model that will is based on the classifications that you've labeled uh, and then you can download that model and uh, for inference you can implement that model in your code so the code itself probably took me half a day to write 
uh, and then maybe another half day to test and make sure you know all the relays are working and the Pi is booting and all that. Um, but the actual gathering of the data took me about three days because um, I wanted all different lights. So the sunlight coming onto my porch from different angles, I wanted to account for that and I wanted to get some night vision photos and some daytime photos just to make sure it can reliably detect whether or not there is or is not a package and there's not some confounding variable in there that's uh, that's tricking it to think that there is a package when there's not. Is it good at detecting different types of packages? Like if the packaging is different or a different type of envelope? It's pretty general. Uh, so I used a variety of different size boxes and different size envelopes. So it's pretty general at detecting things. Um, I never really tested for false positives. I have a good feeling that if I put my cat in front of the door, it would probably say that there's a package. But uh, I think it's just, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how it's making the determination if there is or if there is not a package. But I think it's just, it looks for kind of a, an object of pixels in front of the door. I think that's kind of how it's working. Ah, neat. So did you say you have a video of it, a video of this? I know there's one on YouTube. Yeah, uh, let me uh, let me share. I have some clips I can show. Uh, share screen. Okay. So this is me running away from it and testing it. So at that point, I had unplugged the uh, the siren, which is up here, and the uh, truck horn, which is there, just for the sake of my neighbors. <laughs> and um, so this is my one neighbor who's testing it out. So he's sneaking up. It's a little, um, I think the audio is a little off from what actually happened. So that's where the horn blast goes off. And then he runs away and gets soaked by the sprinkler. Um, this is the wise camera. So it's up at the top of my porch. Uh, this is setting up, so this is the, the sprinkler controller that I'm using, and it's just a 12 volt, uh, 12 volt signal that is just tied into the Raspberry Pi, which is just on the inside there. Uh, the Pi itself and the relay uh, that I'm using, the uh, so it just looks a bit like this, and that all lives in the basement. Um, and this was the flower launcher that I built. So it's, uh, it's not the... Uh, not the most effective or uh or crazy type of thing but the flower is pretty itchy i'm not gonna lie and imagine not knowing what it is you just get blasted with some random white powder and that's then you've true. got these alarms that's very startling that's true it's very true it could be anthrax right yeah <laughs> yeah and it's itchy like you said <laughs> yeah the uh so i i think you should have another i think you should have like a warning one or something that like talks like you remember I don't know if I don't know if this is if any if you have experienced this, but we used to have here. I remember when I was younger, they used to have cars there. If you got really close to the car, it would start talking to you and say, "You're too close to the car." Oh yeah, walk away. It was really annoying. <laughs> yeah, that's not too a bad idea. I might add that. <laughs> For version two, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll go step away from the package because I think what you really want in theory is to um prevent them from taking it more so than punish them for doing it correct yeah um so that's uh but i but I, this is uh, a project that resonated i think with a lot of people that resonates with a lot of people because like, who wouldn't who wouldn't want to stop uh who wouldn't want to stop the porch pirates it's, it's it uh, solves the problem it, sol it <laughs> solves a problem. It solves a problem that we all that everybody you know worries about. So, um, speaking of things that solve problems, I know this is the beginning of the month. So, Ash, you have gathered up the best uh, the best projects we've seen for the month, which obviously this is very high on the list. But uh, what else do we have? I was going to mention that one too. I didn't know he'd be focusing on that project today. But yes, so I feature um, all week long, actually, we here at Tom's Hardware feature Raspberry Pi projects. And once a month, as Ifram just said, I gather a list of the 10 best projects to highlight them once again, just for a little bit of extra love. And all of the projects that we feature, I think they're all fantastic, but these are the ones that stand out to us the most. So go to tomshardware.com to find the full list. Here are a few to get you excited. 
the first one that I wanted to share with you guys. Let me switch my screen. Yeah, here we go. The first one I wanted to share is this Raspberry Pi treat dispenser. So this is a fun project that I'm positive it made a great impact. On, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting all fumbled on my words. This is a fun project that I know for sure made a positive impact in the world because it's a treat dispenser that rewards their dog every time a new follower is detected on Instagram. And what I like best about this project is the maker didn't intend for this, but they unexpectedly discovered that people could unfollow and refollow the same account and it would just reward the dog continuously with more treats. So I'm sure if you wanted to set up a Raspberry Pi treat system like this, you may want to look out for people trying to just overfeed your dog, but it was a it was a clever project. I had to highlight that one first because it was just too fun. And yeah, like I said, I wanted to show off a show off Ryder's project, but we already just did that. It was too fantastic. And I also wanted to ask Ryder, are there any changes that you would add if you were to change? Like I know you have the flower blasting system, but were there any ideas that maybe didn't make it to the table, or maybe you had some limitations that prevented you from doing what you wanted to with it? Uh, the flower, it was supposed to come up from the ground. So I was 3d printing little, um, little things that went into the ground and I was going to bury a pneumatic line. So it would shoot flower up from under people as they were running away, but that wow. turned out to be a little more than, <laughs> little more than I bargained for. That's hilarious. And I'm glad I asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the next one I wanted to show you guys, and this is not one that I recommend you do at home on your favorite Raspberry Pi. This is a really good example of pushing the limitations of the Pi. This maker used the Raspberry Pi CPU as a button. Every time he pokes it, the temperature is lowered just enough to register a change. And you can trigger pretty much anything you want in Python by detecting that change. And again, you definitely shouldn't do this because it could seriously damage your Pi with continuous use. Static discharge is a real problem. You could fry your pie, but you absolutely can do this. It is possible. And I don't know about you guys, but I like seeing the Raspberry Pi push to its limit. And uh, there's also a few things I wanted to show you guys. If you go to the best Raspberry Pi project list at Tom's Hardware, at the bottom, you'll find a few projects that were cooked up by the staff here at Tom's Hardware. And on that list, you'll also find links to guides to recreate these projects yourself. So this one I've got up here is by Les. It's uh, how to overclock your uh, Raspberry Pi 4 if it's running Windows 11. So not only can you run Windows 11, you can overclock it. That's exciting. You should definitely check that out if it's up your alley. But what do you guys think? Did you see anything cool that you want to make yourself? I want to press that button. <laughs> you want to press that button? Yeah, I mean, it's yet another button. And you don't even need to buy a button. Now, granted, that's probably... That's probably terrible for your Pi to be <laughs> deliberately causing it to overheat. But um, but I really I'm just thinking of when you press there. the button, when it's like 60 or 70 degrees C, you're not going to be pressing it for long, are you? That's a quick press, yeah. You yeah. Burn your hands, right? But um, it's it's interesting, right? Because I guess anything anything can be a button if if you can trigger it, right? So. Yeah. So, you know, could you... The maker was talking about that in the comments. He was saying you could probably use something like an HDMI port. If you can tap it on the outside and it picks up your finger, then that's enough to register as a button. No right. GPIO needed. Right. I assume that there's no way of, like, tapping the G a GPIO pin with your finger, though, and making it register. I I don't think it would... You would your finger is... Conduct would it be conductive enough or something? I, I don't know. It'd be but so small, too. Yeah, if you've done how sweaty you are. If you think there's a sweaty though conducts electricity a bit easier. I'm I'm not sure how much current we want really want to put through our viewers tonight. I think that's uh, a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh so so somebody says uh I guess this is a reference to Ryder's project, maybe a launch for some throwdown crackers. Not oh, yeah. Yeah, I like the the like little snappy things. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> Again, yeah. like the flower, they wouldn't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, um, this this is great. I have another project. I have another project for you. This just inspires me. What if you built a a a mechanically controlled bucket that 
dumps green slime on you if it hears you say, I don't know? I don't know. Why, why I don't know? It sounds uh, like you should here, be working for nobody, Slime Time Live. Nobody here has watched You Can't Do That on Television. There was yeah, this, so you'd be think of Nickelodeon. There was that old show. I thought it's whenever they said, I don't know, it drops green slime on them, right? So, and then Nickelodeon <laughs> took that and applied it to their channel. That's why I said Slime Time Live. Yes, everything oh. on the channel was slime for a while. So it's interesting because I guess, you know, if you can if you can shoot flower people based on their taking a package, I guess you could use artificial intelligence to, you know, they'd have to be standing in just the right spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and, uh, uh, well, the I don't know, that would be easy to do with just uh, Google's got like a speech API I used for. Yeah. I can't remember what project, but it's an easy thing to do. Definitely possible. Now, that would be another way you could disarm your system. You could just have like a secret password you say out loud. That's true. That's very true. Actually, I, I remember what I used it for. I, uh, If you've seen The Office, there's a scene where Dwight Schrute you, uh, converts an old um, jewelry store door into security for their office and is a secret password. So I used that to, you have to say a secret password in order not to get blasted with fog. That was the project that I did with that. So it just adapted the slide. So um, Brian asked, what version of the Pi did Ryder use? It is a Pi 4 uh, with 8 gigs of RAM, I believe. Uh, did you need 8 gigs for the for it, or would it have worked with less? It's pro It would probably work with less. I just use my most powerful Pi for everything to try and get as many frames out of the the code as I can for inference, but uh, it, it would definitely work on a Pi Zero. It would just be really, really slow. But I mean, would it work? Did you need the RAM? Would it have worked with a two gigabyte? No, I, th I, I think really I only needed one gigabyte of RAM. So, so theoretically, one could do this with the least expensive Pi Four. You could do this for, for with a thirty-five dollar Pi. Um, uh, Dave Jones says, I don't think I want to press that when my Pi is compiling anything. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think I would want to, <laughs> I would want to press it when the Pi was getting too hot, but hey, people will try, uh, for sure. So speaking of things to try less, you, you've been trying a new video streaming system. Is that correct? Yeah, it's actually not a new video streaming system. It's actually a very old one. It's been around since the Raspberry Pi camera came out so all the way back in uh, 2014, I do believe it was. So Raspberry Pi cameras, uh, you can get the basic model, 1.3, the 2.1, so the basic fixed focus. You can change focus a little bit, but not too much. Or you can go up to the really high-spec HQ camera. Um, this is just using a 2.1 model camera. It's just a the one I've got lying around, as he says. And I'm streaming video from this Pi over Ethernet to my desktop, and it's going straight into OBS as a media source. And this is where I cross my fingers and hope that it works. I'm going to switch to that now. And you can see my lovely face, and you can see a death little um, terminal window there. That's a putty session I've got open. I'm just going to bring up the command. It's a one-line command. There's no programming involved. Um, and all it is is calling the raspy bid command. And I'm going to skip over a few of the um, little arguments we've got here just to get the important ones for now. So the video's width is going to be 1280 by 720. Yes, Dave, 2013. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to have it at 15 frames per second. And this is all going to be streamed over my network. And having all the zeros there just means it'll stream and any device can connect to it. So I'm going to run this command now. And it's waiting for a connection. Now there is a delay in this. It's about a five or six second delay before you start seeing things. Now you're going to see my twin brother pop up in a second. There he is. That is Spike, my twin. And you can see there is a delay. If I start gesticulating wildly now, there you go, there is a long delay. But we have the time on there, we have the date. We have video streaming with one line of code, just one simple bash command. So at the moment, I'm writing a tutorial to show you how to use Raspberry Bid to stream video in two different ways, uh, TCP and RTSP. Both have got pros and cons. 
I'm also going to show you how to use a few more different switches to change how the video looks on the fly. Because believe it or not, even the old Raspberry Pi, um, Raspberry Pi 1 and 2, we're able to use this camera and change the video really quickly and give you good results. You can reuse one of those pies that's just lying around in a drawer somewhere. Wow, so yet something that people have been able to do for a while, but maybe not everybody knows that you can do, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Speaking of things that that aren't brand new, but maybe not everybody knows how to do, uh, I've been spending I've been spending a lot of time creating keyboard shortcuts on my on both my PC and my Pi. Um, on the PC, I've been using something called Auto Hotkey. Uh, in Windows, and I definitely encourage people to check that out because you can make really complex scripts. Uh, I'm still looking for a great, like, complex script type of uh, macro key thing for a Raspberry Pi. So if anyone has one that they would recommend, uh, I'm, I'm all ears. But let me show you how to do some simple stuff. So here we have, I will show you a a Raspberry Pi, latest Raspberry Pi OS desktop, and there is a program in it. There is a file in it that is Etsy XDG open box LXD dash Pi dash RC dot XML. And if you open that, try to make it full screen, it's a little hard to see all the code. You go down to the part that says we look for the keybind part, you can create your own keybinds. They're XML, so you just put uh, keybind, uh, keys equal, and then you put your keyboard combination. So capital C is uh, control, capital A is alt, and then, you know, so you put a dash, if you want control alt C, for example, capital C dash capital A dash lowercase C, and that is control alt c and then you can put an action and the most common action you would probably want is to run a program so the action name you put the action tag the action name equal execute then you put a command tag and you put whatever the launch uh whatever the launch co command is so for chromium it's chromium dash browser for thani it's uh you don't necessarily have to put the full path if it's if the if the program is in your path but it's user bin Thani. Now, one thing that I've been trying to figure out, it works definitely with function keys, but I have not yet been able to, because I don't know if Raspberry Pi OS supports them, get it to work with keys above F12. So um, the interesting reason why you might want something above F12 is, uh, so anyway, once you save that file and then you reboot, uh, you'll be able to use whatever key you create. So if I hit Control Alt C right now, you're going to see uh, that it should launch Chromium. Um, so that's an easy way to save yourself some mouse movements. I'm all about keyboard shortcuts. Let's try and save them every time you lunge for the mouse or reach for the touchpad. You're you're wasting time, but. Um, I'm really also curious how could we get um, how could we get it to recognize keys that are above F12 in Windows you can do it. why would we why would we do that since most people don't have a keyboard with keys above F12 unless you buy an old terminal keyboard which is possible um, here I have and I've shown this on the show before the Raspberry Pi macro pad uh, that's right the Adafruit MacroPad RP2040, which has a Raspberry Pi RP2040 CPU inside, and I've programmed this in CircuitPython so that each of the keys is just going to be seen as F13 through F24. Now, you could program these keys to be any key on the keyboard that you wanted, so you could program them to be like, you know, even a keyboard combo, like Control-Alt-F3 or something. But the reason I chose those extended keys is because they don't conflict with anything. There's nothing in Windows, and there's obviously nothing in uh, Raspberry Pi OS or probably any other uh, modern version of Linux where these keys would have been pre-assigned to anything. So 
they're they're free keys, right? That are not being used for anything. So I'm wondering. Um, so far, I haven't seen an answer, but if anybody in our audience knows how you can get Raspberry Pi to recognize keys above uh, F function keys above F12, I'm all ears. I will say that these do work in Windows, uh, Windows 10, uh, Windows itself. It's weird because if you try to do a keyboard shortcut in Windows with it, uh, with using the, the properties, it doesn't recognize them. But uh, if you use a macro program like uh, like Auto Hotkey or even an OBS's Hotkey section, it will recognize these keys as F13 to F24. Um, the script to do it is really really easy. Maybe I'll I'll post it up, but it's really simple. Circuit Python. All you need to do is just uh, put in the the codes for F13 through F24 to have it send them, and you know it will they will be recognized as those key presses. So uh, anyway, what do, what do you think? Do you guys use a lot of keyboard shortcuts in your daily life? Yes, a lot. And it's become quite difficult for me because just recently, as you all know, in the office, I've built a new PC and I'm running Windows quite a lot these days. Um, and I keep pressing Control Alt T, which in Linux opens a terminal. And I keep forgetting I can't do that. I have to open Putty to do a terminal. And it's been right. bugging me all week. So, right. So you should set that up. You know, you should exactly. set uh I mean, but I also use, and I, I have to figure out what writer you must use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. You probably have one that dumps that dumps flower or shoots something. <laughs> I use more bash aliases than I do keyboard shortcuts. But another another thing to keep in mind, we should totally do a story on bash aliases. So um, I'm looking yeah. for more ways to to go even beyond launching programs, which is the most basic thing, and do more automation of tasks with a keyboard shortcut. Uh, for Windows, of course, there's auto hotkey allows you to do stuff. So for example, in Photoshop, uh, where you normally have to go and move your mouse over to a menu and select prop, I've now programmed it so I can hit a keyboard combo and it'll just like automatically open that menu and, and hit prop for me, saving me precious milliseconds of my life. But, you can also you know, apply keyboard shortcuts to actions in Photoshop. You just made me think of that. There's there's some applications I can't use without keyboard shortcuts. Photoshop is one of them. And whenever I would do deals post for Tom's hardware, I had one button that I would press, and it would like erase my background, make things white, create a new layer, do all this stuff for me that would just be way too tedious to do <laughs> one at yes. a time. Yes, that's if you have the real Photoshop. I'm using Elements. It oh. doesn't let you do that. So I have to use... <laughs> I have to use other tools to make it do that, to go through the menu for me. But uh, yeah, so definitely I feel like there's always room to do more to, you know, those things may save you a few milliseconds of time, but they add up, you know, the more you have to move your mouse around. Every time I have to reach my hand off the home row, that's, that's a loss in, in my book. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in and, and watching. And of course, thank Ryder for joining us and sharing his awesome project. He's going to be working on a how-to for us to actually show you how he did it. Uh, so you can read more about the project on our site. You can watch his videos. And then we're going to actually have a story up, uh, soon about how you can do it yourself. So you can all bug your neighbors. Um, anyway, uh, we are here every Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 7.30 p.m. Uh, UK time, and we will see you next week. Bye, everyone.